As always, I want to thank the Parties Institute, that's P-A-R-D-E-S dot org dot I-L, for helping to make this class happen. Okay, hi, everybody. We're back once again. This is class three in the Omer series of um, the sort of heralds of Zionism. That's what we're doing now. If anybody's joining us or if folks just need a little refresher, what I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork for understanding the movement of Zionism, which really emerged in its full force in the 20th century. But our primary conversation is going to stay more or less in the 19th, although we may sort of dip out depending on who I decide to end with. Um, so what I want to do right now is just touch briefly where we've been already, and then our, in, a, in, in doing that, to review the general structure that we're using, what's the definition of Zionism, what are the fundamental elements that we're looking for. Um, and then our focus today is going to be on the sort of, I would call them original elements of Jewish nationalism. In, through the personality of Leon Pinsker, and in order to understand Pinsker, we're going to have to at least take a sort of broad look at the Russian Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment that happened in Eastern Europe, as opposed to the one we spent quite a bit of time speaking about last semester in Berlin, the Berlin Enlightenment, which of course is uh, Western Europe and is uh, sort of both historically and culturally a very different phenomenon. Okay, so we started out with the religious precursors. Remember Rav Kalischer and um, Rav Alkali and really tracing the fact that, that um, the messianic ideal is built into religious thinking and it lends power to that one side of the whole Zionist endeavor that I've been calling the sort of visionary or redemptive instinct. And in fact, we saw in sort of Rav in the students of the Gra and Rav Kalisher and, and, uh, and Rav Alkali that it was the practical element of actually doing something to build up the Jewish presence in the land of Israel, that was the chidush, that was the innovation for the religious world. But it gives us those two sides of Zionism that we're going to continue to trace which is the visionary redemptive, or even we can call it ideological, and the problem solving, right? And, and what we're gonna have to watch, especially today, is the dance between what's driving what, right? With, with the religious world, it, the messianic visionary had always been the driver of a hope for return to Zion. For some reason, in the sort of the 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, religious personalities, whether it was the Gra, whether it was the Baal Shem Tov, whether it becomes Rav Alka and Rav Kalisher and others, began to think like, we gotta take the reins into our hands to some degree. Right? This natural sort of partnership toward redemption. And we're gonna leave with a question what it was religiously that changed for them, but it became pragmatic. That was the first piece we saw. The second piece we looked at last week in the personality of Moshe Hess um, was this sort of transition of the radical youth out of traditional Jewish culture into what I like to call that secular messianism of socialism, communism, the great sort of humanist movements that see the world through the lens of both revolution, right? That the old world needs to be destroyed in order for a new world to come into being and also cosmopolitanism. Remembering that cosmopolitanism is the idea that all humanity either are or could or should be members of a single community, right? That's communist is a, is a global revolution. Socialism is a global vision. And there are different views, obviously, depending on who you're asking about um, what constitutes that community. Is it a, a moral community? Is it an economic, you know, political, et cetera? But, but the fundamental principle of cosmopolitanism is that all human beings are, should, or could be members of a single community. And therefore, even though it's universalist, right? It's the unit of measure for what matters in history becomes the individual. And then the question becomes, how does society serve the needs of the individual? Right? And Moshe Hess left the fold, so to speak, of his very traditional Jewish family um, and, became, and became one of the sort of earliest thinkers of, um, of German socialism. But we saw that his, his encounter with the historic realities Right, especially in that failed revolution of, of 1848, right? And also his encounters with the sort of latent anti-Semitism he found amongst many of his revolutionary contemporaries, a phenomenon of which, of course, if you're familiar with the 20th century, doesn't go away, right? He essentially turned away from the idea that the individual is the unit of measure, 
for history, for the development of society, and became enamored of the idea that the nation was the critical unit of measure. And I've mentioned, I don't know if it came clear, I mentioned that a lot of that for him was inspired by his readings of and his sort of view from afar of the Italian nationalist movement, Garibaldi, where the thinker of Mazzini, the thinker, right? The, the, these, if you're familiar with the history of um, the idea of liberty, that was a very important um, sort of moment in time, both culturally, historically, and intellectually. And that's why he chose to call his book Rome and Jerusalem. Because he saw the Italian example as people who believed in all human liberty. They were, they were you know, Democrats, small d, but ideologically, you know, Democrats. But they saw the vehicle for that realization of human freedom to be a national endeavor. And so Hess said, wow, that seems to make much more sense than co cosmopolitanism. That the idea that the, the vehicle was this all-embracing community. No, the vehicle, the unit of measure for history, for society will now be in his mind, the nation. Right? And, we, and I pointed out to you that this is a new form of internationalism, right? That the Jew has been sort of international, right? The Jews are essentially the original international people, right? We've been scattered. We don't have a centralized homeland. We, you know, fit into whatever culture, wherever we are, all the, there are many quite hateful characterizations of the Jew as the international people. But it is a fair statement that the Jews are the original international people. We've been tracing that reality since the destruction of the Second Temple. Those of us have been together for a couple of years, right? And therefore, Hess's realization that the visionary element, and he never gives up on that. It's very important to remember. He never gives up on the utopian socialist vision for a redeemed society, human society. What he does, he shifts the unit of measure from an individual cosmopolitan view to a nationalist view. And he, of course, also points out that nationalism is, you gotta be careful, right? Because it's a degenerate nationalism that seeks to elevate itself through the denigration of others. Right? He understood the dangers of chauvinism, of sort of like hyper-patriotism, of uh, how much easier it is to unify a nation through the hatred and rejection of others that, you know, nothing unites like an enemy, et cetera. He wrote extensively about these things in, in Rome and Jerusalem. But nevertheless, he really understood that the history of humanity is a history of nations. And he uses, as we pointed out, a very Hegelian, like it's a very um, sort of romantic nationalist language, which is not surprising because that's the educational and intellectual milieu in which he was formed. So that's a, a bit of a review and the key to take out of Hess if we took from the religious world the sense that the intrinsic stance of religious Zionism, to miss, it's an anachronism, but we'll call it that, was redemptive. And the Hiddish, the innovation was, wow, we actually have to participate practically in redemption. The, the um, Hess's switch from the sort of universal toward the particular, from the cosmopolitan to the national, was, was a taking of his visionary element and realizing that the actual practical way in which it could be embodied in the world was through a national scale. And as we pointed out, the recognition that anti-Semitism is a problem that he didn't think was going to go away when, um, when the world became free, right? We pointed out how the Damascus blood libel of 1940, he himself says in Roman Jerusalem was a turning point for him when the sort of world liberal press took for granted that, oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the Jews would do a blood libel. I mean, not maybe these guys, that might be, but, but the idea that Jews do blah, blah, of course, that's what the Jews are. And his recognition that that was kind of baked in, so to speak, to the foundations of this liberal European culture, which had produced the socialist utopian visions of which he was so enamored, right? And so why, why am I sort of hammering that home? Because, because just like the messianic piece will stay in the substrata of the Zionist endeavor. We pointed out it doesn't really burst out until 1967, although it has its contributions before that. It doesn't really burst out until 1967, right? So too, the, the socialist utopian vision will, will remain part of the substrata of the entire Zionist endeavor. And, and if we were gonna go further into like a full course on Zionism, we'd see the names that you're familiar with, people like Ben Gurion is probably the best example, but, but the whole labor movement sort of rides this very strange fusion between the cosmopolitan socialist vision and the nationalist Jewish vision. 
And there's a lot of thought and effort and sort of like dancing at two weddings and strange kind of combinations that go into crafting a culture which can combine them. But the fundamental way in which it's done is that the socialist is a utopian visionary element and the nationalist is the practical problem solving element, right? That it's all well and good to hope for a socialist utopia, but if you don't get the Jews out of exile, anti-Semitism gonna kill them. <laughs> like um, on some level, that is exactly what Hess saw. There'll be more to that down the line, but we're, we're, we're gonna only do what we can do. So, so keeping in mind that what we're pointing out is that what lies at the base of the practical um, Zionist endeavor. So that's the, a bit of a review of the first two. Um, I'm watching the comments here. I'm not seeing any questions. So like I said, as a reminder, I invite you guys who, who want clarifications that, um, that you can put them right there in the chat. So moving forward, what we need to do before we can really understand Pinsker, Leon Pinsker, who writes what is a You froze in. Mike? Might have to put it in the chat. Okay. Your voice froze. I heard that uh, you can't see me. I, I see you all. I'm moving. Can you he still hear me? Now no. we can. Okay. It's okay now. We hear you. About 20 seconds. Okay now. You were frozen, right. but now you're okay. But wait, wait, I guess you can still hear me. Um, so, Okay, great, thank you. So, so um, we need to understand, again, a little bit of the rise of nationalism, I'm not gonna do it all, we need to touch a little bit on what is the nation state. We need to understand um, what is the pale of settlement? What was this sort of organic body of what comes known as the Ostjuden, the, the Jews of the East, right? Um, and of course we have to understand, again, it, to a minimal degree, what was the version of the Jewish enlightenment that took place there, what's known as the Haskalah as opposed to the Berlin enlightenment. So let's start with nation state because um, I just wanna hit a few key points because you have to remember today, we take for granted that the nation state is the sole legitimate expression of national existence. But that was not so of course for most of human history and it's really a product of post-World War I in many ways is when they, that shifts within Europe it's post-World War I where, where the international empires cease to be legitimate. And then post-World War II, when you finally take away their colonial holdings and most of the rest of the, what we now know as the developing world sort of breaks up into nation states to the point where today, the world international body is called the United Nations. People don't often think about that, but it means that by definition, if you're not a nation, you're not a player. You can be an observer, like the Vatican has it says the Palestinians are fighting. Are they an observer status? Is there a state of Palestine, et cetera, right? Now, um, a, so that was not an accident, nor was it a given. It is a direct product of the same social forces which will shape a very important element of the Zionist endeavor. So if we're, gonna, if we're going to define a nation state, you're gonna define it usually with three elements of sort of practical elements, and there's kind of a fourth, and then one philosophical. The three practical elements are number one, territory. There must have boundaries. And on some level, you can think of a state as an organism. An organism has boundaries. You don't have boundaries, you're not alive. And they might be porous boundaries. We're not talking about closed borders, et cetera, but, but you have to be able to say, this is and that is not, right? Um, that's number one. Number two, history. Now, history may sound just as obvious as boundaries, but those of you who've been in the class for even more than 10 minutes probably realize that it's not, it's not so simple because how we tell the story of our history in many ways shapes our present culture. So th that's why um, on one hand, historians will be the tool of state building, right? And, and, and you know, we can all, I'm sure, think back in our own education, whatever country you're from, whether it was George, Apple, George Washington, you know, cannot tell a lie, yes, I cut down the cherry tree, um, or, or whether it was the sort of um, I I immaculate moral perfection of uh, the sort of the Zionist endeavor who came here and, and only wanted good for everybody. We tell a story of the past, which gives legitimacy to the present political institution. But of course, it's A, a, what's called a revisionist one. We can be tools for deconstructing the state. So, so let's not forget about that. But in, in general, you've got boundaries. You've got some sort of history agreed upon. Who, who we are now is a, is a product of 
who we have been in the past, and language. Right? Language is a very important one, and it plays a huge philosophical role. We're not going to go in depth into European Romantic nationalism, but if people have some familiarity with it, they'll know that linguistic nationalism, which we will touch upon going forward, um, is, a, is a sort of a centerpiece of how you can construct a nation. Now I say construct because there's a deeper philosophical discussion that we don't need to get into right now about whether nations are some organic sort of unit of history or whether they're a product of social forces of the 19th century that put them together. I don't know, it's actually quite an interesting discussion. People want, they can, I don't know, email, email me and we'll make a time to talk about it. I have quite a bit to say, but, but, but for now, nations are. Territory, history, language. I would add to that, by the way, a sort of um, the rational bureaucratic organization of government. It's very important that, that the state depends upon a, um, an organization, right? Which was true, by the way, of, of medieval empires as well. The, the difference being is that there's a very um, tight uh, correlation between the nature of education, literacy, printing, communications, media, and the rise of the modern state. Just keep that in, in mind if we were gonna go further with Zionism, you would, uh, um, ah, so I, I have a question here. The, Two of them was okay, territory, history, language. The fourth, as I said, is this sort of bureaucratic organization. And the challenge to language, someone's pointing out there are multilingual states like Switzerland and Belgium. First of all, those are a bit of the exception that proves the rule, if you think about the histories of those states. Second of all, it's not that you can't be a nation state without any of these. As I said, without territory, you can't be a nation state. Without history, you can't be a nation state. You can be a nation state with some debate around language, although it usually refle reflects a split both within territory and history. There's just been some social force that has caused you to compromise. Um, you know, okay. So, but functionally, this is the unit of national realization which is on the rise. And that leads to the philosophical point. Because in addition to the practical point, again, territory, history, language, and the fourth I'm adding, which is sort of bureaucratic organizational structure. But what lies behind that is the belief that that, a, that the nation is the sole legitimate source of authority and government. Um, someone asked what about religion, I would say not. Religion is not necessary for a state. In fact, those of us have been together for, for quite some time. We spoke about how in 1648 in the Treaty of Westphalia and the rise of, of multi-religious societies where you could be a Catholic or a Protestant, but you could still be a citizen of France. Right, that was the beginning of the modern nation state. But that's, again, it's further into the discussion I want to go. But this idea that um, legitimate government is national self-government gets its most sort of um, clear expression in, of course, the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, remembering that, that the Declaration of the Rights of Man was the sort of um, philosophical and practical political declaration of the National Assembly that took France from a feudal monarchy into, a, let's call it a proto-democracy, since. Napoleon came along real quick and kind of made it into an empire. But, but the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is pointed to as a seminal document in Western culture, says the following. The principle of sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body of men, no individual can exercise authority that, that, that does not emanate expressly from it. So if you got your thinking cap on, you probably realize that that sounds really dramatic. And most of us probably heard something very democratic in it. I mean, sovereignty resides essentially in the nation, right? The problem is, is who's the nation, right? Because practically speaking, where is this nation you speak of? And that goes back to language, territory, and history, most importantly. I'll just put my cards on the table, for those of you who don't know. What I'm doing is not about the past. What I'm doing is about the present and the future that I'm interested in. Because, because I know that if I can tell a story about the past in a way in which we'll unite as opposed to divide, then we have more of a hope of living in the future that I want, right? And, and, and part of that is how do you tell a story to multiple types of people? Without wanting to toot my own horn, I'll just point out to you that, that when I podcast, I know that there are religious and secular. There are Christians and Jews, 
There are um, conservatives and liberals. There are people that work for the Encounters organization, if you're familiar with them, which does, uh, you know, not just Israeli-Palestinian dialogue, but actually trying to almost shift the balance in that dialogue. And there are people who are part of the Hilltop Youth. And, and what I'm trying to do is tell a story which isn't parv, which means they're like, okay, I'm not offending anybody, but actually is able to challenge everybody enough that they grow, but is able to speak to everyone enough that they listen. And that's how you build a people. That's how you build a people. And that's why I'm mentioning it here. And a lot of that hinges the question of who is this nation? What is legitimate? Who are we telling this story for? And that is gonna become quite important as we go forward. So that is a very nutshell, um, sort of working definition of what the context of the nation state. And I'm bringing it to you now because it, from the late 18th through the whole 19th century, this is the rising tide of human organization within Europe first, but then all over the world. Now, in all fairness, by the way, it really starts in, in, in South America and, and North America, if you know the history of nationalism. But, but for our purposes, the Jewish story is centered in Europe right now. That's where most of the Jews are. So that's where we're focused. Okay, just briefly pause, quick, just simple clarification questions on this, this functional notion of the rise of the nation state. You will write them in the chat. It's probably the easiest way to do it, but I'm not opposed to hearing. Yeah. Mike, it's Sorry. interesting how we tend to think of the word nation state almost as a single word. There's a hyphen there, but many states are multi-nations. You know, yeah. you've got the Germans being thrown out of Czechoslovakia after the Second World War, etc. There's all these. And, and this will be important for the Zionist story going forward. And thank you for pointing it out, Chuck. What we're interested in here is more nation than state. And in fact, right up to a very late stage of Zionism was not given by any means that the end goal of the Zionist movement was a state in the land of Israel. It was certainly a given by, by late stage that the end goal was a place to reconstitute the nation within the land of Israel. And thank you for pointing out, I'm using a bit of an anachronism, that conflating nation and state is a product of our world today, but it's not in any way how it began. Great, other questions or clarifications? You can write them down too. Okay, great. So, so next piece is a little bit, if that's the sort of um, socio-political context, the bigger picture, let's talk about the Pale of Settlement. Where are all the Jews that we're interested in speaking about today? Um, the Pale, which I'm hoping you've heard of, was first created by Catherine the Great in 1791, right? What was the context? You may remember we spoke about it at the end of last semester that Poland, went on the chopping block, basically in the latter third of the, um, what's that, the 18th century, several times. Well, we don't need to go into history of Poland, which is of course the, the, the disappearing and reappearing state of, of Central Europe. But it went on the chopping block several times and it had a lot of Jews. And in 1791, Catherine acquired Eastern Poland in the wake of one of the partitions. And it meant that for the first time in Russian history, the empire actually possessed territory with a large population of Jews. Now that may sound strange to you because people think like Russian Jew is like, a, like if, if nation state is one word, then, then Russian Jew is one word, right? But that began in 1791. And you can imagine that uh, the Russians who were deeply immersed, not all of them, I don't wanna generalize, but, but a good portion of the populace in, um, in classic Christian anti-Semitism, remembering that medieval anti-Semitism had two elements. Um, yeah, I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna explain uh, what, what the pale was in a second. I just wanna first talk about how the Jews came, right? Classic medieval anti-Semitism had two elements. One was the religious element, we killed their God, which you can imagine is a big turnoff. And the other one was the economic competitor element, that the Jews as the sort of mobile, almost liquid element of the very rigid caste society were always in direct competition with the burghers and the rising middle class is a bit of anachronism, but let's say the rising, the, the, the merchants, the, the guildsmen, the craftsmen, the people who were not the landed aristocracy and were not the serfs. So the economic and the religious anti-Jewism, anti let's call it, um, it rose, like, reared its ugly head almost immediately in 1791, right, the merchants of Moscow in particular banded together and began to protest the influx of Jewish merchants who as soon as they were made part of the empire saw a whole new 
um, sort of uh, markets open up because they, I, I should say they had been banned, Jews had been banned from the Russian empire up until this point um, with rare exceptions. Uh, so they wanted none of what I have quoted here, the well-known fraud and lies of the Jews, which made competition with them impossible. And so therefore they demanded that the Jews be confined and Catherine actually acceded to that demand and she created what was known as the pale. The, the word likely is drawn from the Latin palace for stake, which eventually came to mean like a stake fence, right? She essentially drew a line on the map on the east. Remember, Poland is to the west of Russia. So she acquired territory to the west, but she wanted to keep the Jews in the west. So she drew a line to the east, which marked off the new provinces that she'd acquired beyond which the Jews couldn't move any further east for permanent residency for sure. And at many times they couldn't even travel, even for business or, or, or other purposes, east of the Pale. On the west, it was bounded by the, Aust it was bounded, sorry, by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, uh, and um, wait, in, in Prussia. And the Jews were kept back from the border, by the way, as well. So they were bounded on both sides. They weren't allowed to live on the border with Prussia and Austria-Hungary because there was concern that they couldn't be trusted, that they weren't loyal citizens, you don't want. And those smugglers and, and cattle traders it was a long-standing Jewish tradition at this point in history. So she confined them into what, I mean, the pale grew and shrank depending on, you know, what year, but um, essentially, if you're familiar with the map of um, Central and Northern, Eastern and Northern Europe, it, it, it covered most of uh, present-day Latvia and Lithuania, Belarus, good parts of Ukraine, Moldova, and most of Poland and even parts of Western Russia. It's a huge territory, but within that, there were also major cities, like Kiev is probably the best example, from which the Jews were, were um, excluded. So even within the Pale, there were deep restrictions on what Jews, where they could travel, what, what um, sort of uh, livelihoods they could pursue. Certainly, Russia was not a democratic society, so the whole society was quite constrained in its rights for freedom of speech, assembly, political organization, right? Um, now, you should understand that at, as the 19th century progresses, the Pale is going to become the largest concentration of Jews in its day, to the point where, I mean, it really only officially breaks up, along with so many other things, uh, in World War I. Once the Russian Revolution takes place in 1917, at the height of World War I, the pale as a um, legal uh, element um, doesn't really exist any longer. Although, of course, as a concentration of Jews, it continues to exist until the Nazis get there, in which case then it ceases to be a concentration of Jews. Um, but as the 19th century progresses and into the turn of the 20th century, at its height, there will be nearly 5 million Jews in the pale. That's 40% of the world Jewish population at around the turn of the 20th century. So let's just appreciate that if you're going to look for the Jews as a nation in our sort of defined sense where, where there's a territory, right? And, and they have a collective history and they share a language. So you're, the pale is probably the first place to look at this point. Of course, what's the language they're speaking? It's Yiddish. And we're gonna see that, that, that not, and not just one type of Yiddish, if people are familiar with Yiddish, of course, as many dialects and maybe familiar with the great dividing line between sauerkraut and applesauce, right? That, that really splits the Yiddish speaking world. Um, if you don't get it, we can talk about the joke later. Um, the, I, get, I get some chuckles there. That's always nice to know. Um, the, but, but we're gonna see that Yiddish itself becomes a source of controversy within the more, let's call it nationalist and emancipated elements of Jewish life. So, so that's the pale. And you know, life in the pale is proverbially difficult. I mean, we've all seen Fiddler on the Roof. Right, um, and, and, and as difficult as difficulty may be, it also has one major benefit, because it will produce solidarity, right? Nothing unites like an oppressor. It's, it's something, in fact, that, that, that oppressive um, empires seem to forget every time. That like, it, it, you know, divide and conquer is a much better strategy when pursued with the carrot instead of the stick. Right? And if you're looking to, to sort of maintain your rule over people, oppressing them collectively is one of the best ways to get them to drop their differences and unite. And Lord knows, if you can do that to the Jews, you could probably do it to anybody. So the, the very difficult 
conditions within the pale create at least an, an outside perception, meaning in Western Europe, remember the Jews are much more emancipated at this point, that, that, that um, you know, uh, just to reference last semester for those of us who were together, Moses Mendelssohn publishes Jerusalem in 1783. The French Revolution, it, it, which brings emancipation to the Jews, the revolution is 1789, but the civil emancipation of the Jews in France is 1791, the same year that the Pale is created. And so the, even though um, there are fits and starts like we spoke about with Moshe Hess and Napoleon brings the ideals of the revolution to much of Western Europe and then there's a reactionary move, the Jews essentially in Western Europe by, by the time we get to our story today have an assumption of at least the, the goal of emancipation, if not the actual experience of it. This is not so amongst Eastern Jews. What have come, become known as Ostjuden, and since that's German, did I say that right, Peter? One thumb up, two thumb up, right? Um, so you can tell it's a perception from the outside, right? And so what, what's interesting, uh, I'll just mention it now, and if we, I haven't decided if we're gonna talk about Achad Am, but if we get to some of the other Zionist thinkers, you'll see that there's, there's a romanticization by the Western emancipated Jews who are following a track of assimilation when they look at their oppressed brethren in the East, who on one hand have less rights and freedoms, on the other hand are seen as the healthy body of the Jewish people within Europe, the us student. Why? Because they have geographic concentration, because they are largely left to manage their own affairs, and because the experience of oppression has caused them to unite in a way in which Western European Jews do not experience. Um, and they're, they're culturally Jewish. You can think of, by the way, that the, 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 in many ways, the Middle Ages are alive and well in the Pale of Sediment. And, and even though the Middle Ages get a bad name from a modernist perspective, from, from Jewish history perspective, the one major benefit that the Middle Ages offered was a very clear way of being Jewish, which modernity, as we've spoken about at length, challenged. Um, so that is... I think what I want to say, oh, one more thing about the pale, because if we're there, we might as well just mention it, um, that, that Torah is thriving in the pale. And this is beyond just being proud of Torah, there's an important difference between the emancipation, which will come out of Eastern Europe, than the one which come, came out of Western Europe. You may remember, once upon a time, I mentioned to you that the Alter Rebbe, right? The Alter Rebbe was the, you can argue whether he's a chief student. Let's just say the Alter Rebbe, founder of Chabad Hasidu, one of, the, one of the chief students of the Magimu Mezrich, right, the one who argued with the Gra, if you recall, we had that whole story. Um, he, the, the, he has a, a somewhat famous letter that he sent to one of his, his um, students when Napoleon Bonaparte looked like he was actually going to conquer Russia. Now remember, on one hand, Bonaparte conquers Russia, the Jews gain emancipation. On the other hand, Bonaparte conquers Russia and the Jews face emancipation. And at this point, it was clear to the religious leadership, particularly the Hasidic leadership, that with emancipation came the destruction of Torah. It didn't have to be so. We haven't spoken about what we call today neo-Orthodoxy or modern Orthodoxy, Rav Hirsch, and all those things. But, but from the, their perspective, a closed Jewish society was a healthy Jewish society. So therefore, he writes in this letter, the Alter Rebbe, as Bonaparte, as Napoleon is approaching, if Bonaparte will be victorious, Jewish wealth will increase and the prestige of the Jewish people will be raised, but their hearts will disintegrate and be distant from their father in heaven. But if Alexander, the Tsar of Russia, will be victorious, though Israel's poverty will increase and their prestige will be lowered, their hearts will be joined, bound and unified with their father in heaven. Just appreciate what we would today call the sociological analysis that he's bringing to this, because it's not just, although oh, I'll become fry and they'll leave God, he notices that their hearts will be joined to one another. I mean, he understands that the oppression that the Russian Empire subjected the Jews of the Pale to not only preserved their loyalty to Torah, but it actually enhanced their solidarity one with the other. And so the, the um, Hasidut is actually, if not the main, certainly half of the religious life within the Pale. Um, it's widespread along with the orthodoxy that, that you were perhaps uh, more familiar with, depending on where you come from and, and, and how you were raised. Um, he, just as one point of interest that the pale actually gives birth to the modern yeshiva model. Right? In 1803, one of the, one of the key, uh, key students of, of uh, the Grah, of Chaim of Elosian, 
establishes the yeshiva of Lozhen, which becomes known as the sort of Harvard or Ivy League of the yeshiva world. That is the yeshiva model as you know it today. The Chaim is the one who put the idea of Torah lishma, of Torah learning as a supreme value for its own sake, at the center of religious life. It was a yeshiva model which took elite students from all over and brought them to a, a centralized and isolated institution, as opposed to the previous model where people would learn in, in, within the communities in which they live. There's all kinds of consequences. But for our story right now, one of the major consequences is that this was the higher education to which most of the coming enlightened Jews ever had access, right? And, and that will mean that unlike the generation after Mendelssohn, who felt like they had to abandon their traditional Jewish perspective in order to gain the perspective of the Enlightenment, that the, the Eastern European Enlightenment, what's known as the Haskalah, right, um, will have baked in at its base a deeper knowledge of Judaism and the assumption that it, classical sources can be used in service of enlightened aims. And we're going to see that that will have real consequences. So, so um, here we are in the pale. Like I said, in many ways, Middle Ages living peacefully on, in general, industrialization and, and capitalism were quite slow to come to Russia as a whole, certainly to the pale, even slower. And even when it came to the pale, the Jews were often left out. The, the, what we're gonna call the ethnic body, for lack of a better term, of Am Yisrael is solid through that geographic concentration, through the solidarity which is created by oppression, and also through the deep, development of the organic culture around Torah. But even here in the heartland, the enlightenment has begun to penetrate. And there's one last thing we need to understand about what's about to emerge, the Haskalah, is, is that the, one of the other differences of the enlightenment, which emerges out of Eastern European Jewry, is it's the lack of cultural competition. What do I mean? Is that in Vienna or Berlin, Everybody wants to be a part of the German-speaking elite. Right? We saw Mendelssohn's arc, those of us who were together last semester, right? And, and we raised the question of how much of his idealization of enlightenment um, values and, and conceptual frames was a thinly sort of uh, cloaked desire to be accepted amongst the cultural elite of his society. Everybody wants to be one of the beautiful people, right? In Russia, Tolstoy and romanticism aside, the Jews are looking around and they don't want to be like the people around them. They don't want to be like the Russian peasants. The Russian nobility is not particularly present in the pale, nor are they particularly intellectually and culturally sophisticated. I mean, they're still speaking French at this point. I mean, they, they, are, they are imitating the ways of Western European enlightenment. And, and this will have a, a sort of another element of deep impact um, because if in the Berlin enlightenment back in Western Europe, there was sort of a, um, a, an arc of enlightenment, conversion, assimilation, and then ultimately the creation of reform, which is in certain ways a pulling back toward an organic Jewish life, but in many ways is just an amalgamation. So what's gonna happen in Eastern Europe is very different. So we're gonna look at that very briefly in the life of uh, Isaac Bear Levinson, but before I do, pause, then we have our introduction to nationalism, the rise of the nation. We've got a context of the pale, culturally and uh, geographically. Questions, comments, things people want clarified before I introduce Levinson and, and what's known as the Haskalah. All right, I'm looking at the chats. Great, people have questions. You can always write it there. It doesn't break my flow to see it. I may or may not address it directly. Okay, so, excuse me, pause, recapitulation. Oh wait, I have a question. Were they all poor, someone asked? No, for sure not. There's no, there's no such thing as a society of people who are all poor. Of course, even just sociologically, that doesn't happen. Poverty was widespread. But let's remember that Russian, Russian peasantry was, was quite poor. And Russia is a backwards country industrially relative to the rest of Europe. Nevertheless, the Jews were survivors. And we still serve as, as a liquid mercantile, more sophisticated element within the, in the economy there. Poverty was widespread. It's not like we were living high on the hog, if a Jew can never live high on the hog, but um, the, uh, the, it's not like we were, you know, um, we're going to talk about the Cantonists, et cetera. Um, don't worry about that. But, but yeah, I don't want to paint the sort of like what's called the lacrimose 
image of Jewish history, that it was just suffering, 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 and doubt, right? Um, but I do want to introduce, so hopefully that answers the question, and someone mentioned the Cantonists, we're going to get to that in, as part of Levinson's story, because we're still in the pale. My goal here is that you understand the, the, the um, context from which Pinsker's worldview emerges, because Pinsker himself, as we'll see, it was actually not so critical, but there, he's held up as an as a essential herald of Zionism. And, and hopefully by the time we're done, you'll understand why. Um, okay, so Isaac Bear Levinson, with your permission, I'll go on. Levinson was a typical youth of his days, born in 1788 um, in Ukraine. Oh, sorry, I can, I can write his name down. Somebody asked me to do a little bit of that. I'll put, I'll put um, one second, I'll just get my thing on everyone. Isaac Bear Levinson. Um, so Isaac Bear Levinson, he's born in 1788 in the Ukraine to a traditional Jewish family, because that's kind of like what everybody was. And it's one of these stories, we know how it goes. He's recognized as a prodigy from a young age, um, which means not only in a Torah, he had uh, a, a unique aptitude for languages, apparently. Um, so because of his gifted nature and his sense that he was stuck in a very small world, the first turn he made in his youth was, was very much the same turn that, his, that most of his peers made, which was toward Hasidut, right? Because Hasidut offered, as we spoke about last semester, uh, this mythic horizon that though you may be stuck socio-politically and physically in a, in a narrow place of the pale, the, the inner horizons that Hasidut opens are, are very real and very profound, and I'm, as you know, a very big fan. But um, he, he encountered, like many of his peers, fairly quickly that um, the price of entry into these broad places of inner space that Hasidut was offering was a retreat from the modern world. Right? And, and this actually helps us understand why it is that the conflict, and we're not going to go into it now, but you need to know that there was a vehement conflict between both, especially the Galician uh, Enlightenment, which we're not going to speak about, uh, we'll mention in a second a little bit, and, and the Hasidim, but also the, the Haskalah that comes up in the pale between them and the Hasidim. It was like to the point where they, they would try to ban each other's books and they would try to get inside the government. To, why? Well, Haskalah means, we translate it as enlightenment, but you know, it, it's a bit of a misnomer. The Haskil, Right, if you dive in Ashkenaz, right? Chocha bina the has, you know, has, wait, I can't, no, wait. Chocha bina the haskil, right? Like, um, it's like something you say three times a day, and then when you want to quote it, you just can't, you can't pull it out, right? That, that it's a discernment, right? La skill is to discern. And of course, to discern something, you need a clear framework for judgment, right? Nobody wants to be judgmental. Everybody wants to be discerning. And so the argument that the masculine, these people who were able to discern the world, remember this is the modern era, as it really is, um, they're able to discern the world as it really is, the argument is that Hasidut is an obscurantist movement. What it's doing is it's, it's, it's ignoring or covering over or deliberately fudging the world around us in order to gain perhaps something very real, and I'm not gonna go into the polemic right now, but, but their whole desire was to know the world as it really was. And so um, Be Levinson turned away from the Hasidic world, and he turned at first unconsciously um, toward the Haskalah, toward the Enlightenment. Why do I say unconsciously? Because his real encounter with the Haskalah came because of his ill health. He uh, was, he was uh, subject to what they, in the, his generation called nervous disorders. Right? They say it was brought on by his intelligence and his intensive study. I don't know. Um, either way, they sent him to Brody in Galicia to seek a cure for his, what, what ailed him. Um, Galicia, just for context, um, if you don't know where it is, is that it was the piece of Poland which during the, the partition was lopped, or not lopped, was, was stuck onto the Austrian Empire. And Galicia has a rich Jewish history unto itself. We can only do what we can do, right? Uh, oh, no, you don't like the Galicianers? That's like a whole, like, I'm not going there right now. Um, but but, but he, so he sent to Brody, which is the sort of chief um, Jewish cultural capital of Galicia, um, to seek a cure 
and, and we can decide whether he found a cure or he found a new disease, because there he meets um, all of the leading lights of the Galician, the, the Galician Haskalah, the, the Galician Enlightenment, and in particular, in particular Nachman Krochmal. I'll put his name down there as well for you, because Krochmal, who, you know, because what I'm trying to say, relatively focused, we're not going to go into, but um, Krochmal actually represents for us, um, he represents for us a very important model, because who is he? Um, he's an authority of rabbinic learning, right? He is a relatively traditional Jew in his own right, but he, his perhaps best known work is what's known as More Nevuche Hazman, right? A guide to those who are perplexed by the times, right? Krachma, which of course is, is borrowing the title from Maimonides' sort of famous philosophical work, right? More Nevuchim, right? The, a guide for the perplexed, right? And remember what Maimonides is trying to do in the guide for perplexed is, is provide a framework through which the few students who could comprehend it we're going to be able to reconcile philosophy and revealed religion. That was the big issue that Maimonides was facing. What Krochmal is trying to do is help his students and readers reconcile between traditional Judaism and modernity, right? And, and notice his desire is to reconcile. And the tools he brings to bear are just as much traditional tools of Jewish learning as they are, um, as they are um, the, the sort of conceptual framework of the Enlightenment. And because of this, and he's, again, I'm using him as an archetype, we're not gonna go into his story, but, but, but because of that perspective, the Haskalah, the Enlightenment which emerges in Eastern Europe is fundamentally different than that in, in Western, right? The, the, oh, Peter, you're gonna probably have to grind your teeth when I say this. The, the Wissenschaft de Judentum, okay? Okay, okay. Well, okay, I'll, get, I'll take the middle, right? Um, this sort of science of Judaism, which emerges, and we haven't spoken about it, we're not going there now, don't be nervous, but it's a critical historical scientific posture, which is one of the great products of Western European Jewish enlightenment. It's from the outset, takes the tools of academia and tries to stand outside Judaism and critique, and, 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 and in fairness, its desire was to reform and and to continue to grow, but because it stands on the outside, it has a fundamentally different stance than what's known in Galicia and in the Pale, the, the sort of Eastern equivalent of the Wissenschaft was Chochmat Yisrael. It's called Chochmat Yisrael. The very fact that it's in Hebrew and not in German or a foreign language kind of says it all. It's an attempt from within to figure out what is the wisdom of the Torah today, right? And, um, as opposed to being the products of the university, because of course there in the pale, the Jews weren't allowed into university, most of the leading lights of this Chochmat Yisrael, of, of the Haskalah of the, of the pale, were autodidacts. They trained themselves. And, and their mastery of traditional knowledge was the, not only the way in which they originally learned to learn, but it was the basis of their passion for enlightenment methods. I mean, you can find every type of thought within our sages. Trust me. It's, you know, it's, kind of, it's true of the Torah, by the way, too. Like, you know, you, if you want, you can read the Torah as a, a liberal, universalist, um, sort of a, a Western democratic democ the document. And if you want, you could read it as a tribalist, sort of like um, narrow-minded, uh, mystic nationalist document and everything in between. Why? Because it's there to teach you about yourself. <laughs> so, so you better be careful in what you see in it. So the sages work the same way. Um, and so, so there in Galicia, Levinson, Isaac Bear Levinson, after meeting Krochmal and encountering this whole way of thinking, he catches fire for this notion of enlightenment. He brings it back to the pale. He's eventually known as the Russian Mendelssohn. And he deserves the title as, as a founding father of the Russian Haskalah, of the Russian Jewish enlightenment. Um, so he, and for our story, the impact that Levinson has on the sort of precursors to Zionism really has a lot to do with, um, the, with the, the central enlightenment notion he brought back with him, which is the importance of language as a vehicle for enlightenment. If you know anything about the Western, uh, we didn't talk about the Berlin Enlightenment after Mendelssohn, but if you know anything about the enlightenment movements within Judaism, you know that one of the great battlegrounds was Hebrew, was the revival, so to speak, of the Hebrew language. 
the development of the Hebrew language into a modern language where you could speak about philosophy, where you could write modern poetry, etc. Right, and so um, Isaac Baer's first work is um, called Tuda Yisrael, right? Tuda in the sense of a testimony or an affirmation, and its goal is to convince the Jews that the study of the Hebrew language is essential. Something that today we're like, wait, wait, you had to be convinced, but yes, they had to be convinced. Right, and, and that's a battle that will continue between the Zionists and the anti-Zionists, not anymore, but all the way down through the early days of the state, that battle of whether one should learn Hebrew or not. Um, not only though, was he trying to convince them to learn Hebrew, but he also was trying to convince them that it was both permissible and necessary to learn Russian. And that the advantages of learning secular subjects, which would open up to you once you actually could read Russian, far outweighed the dangers of learning things like science and history. Um, so, but again, if you look at Tudat Israel, you see the difference between the Visionschaft and Chokmat Israel. Because in his introduction, Levinson marshals the Yushalmi, the Rambam, he even brings the Shlach Kodesh, if you're familiar, as, as proof to argue that Jews should be writing and speaking in Hebrew. I promise you that if Leopold Zunz back there in the Visionschaft knew who the Shlach Kodesh was, he wasn't ever going to quote it. <laughs> you know? If you don't know who the Shlach is, it's fine. But, but uh, Hamevin Yavin, as the Shlach would say. Um, so, so it, it could be, again, that Levinson was himself just simply more conservative, small c. But my argument is that, that um, the culture from which he emerged was more organically Jewish because of its continuity and its geographic concentration and the solidarity which emerged from oppression. And also, the competition was very weak. <laughs> like I'm telling you, they looked around they didn't really have a burning desire to be like the Russians that were around them, right? And not only that, um, there is the fact that the Romantic movement is now the dominant strain within general European thought and not the more intellectual element of classic enlightenment. And this means that national sentiment is gaining ground as a real competitor to rationality. Right? Remember, that, that, that the Western European Enlightenment, the vision shop, was founded on a scientific approach to Judaism, right? Which means that they're seeking for objective and therefore universal truth, rationality versus revelation. And they were going to strip away everything which they felt to be parochial, and, you know, and, and particular and superstitious, and they believed they would be left with a purified religion. That was like a classic intellectual enlightenment thought. The romantic version is what we call the Volkgeist. I'm sure I said that wrong, right? Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the national spirit, as the romantics would call it. And um, that's going to, if it finds articulation anywhere, find its voice amongst this body of the nation, this ethnic concentration here in the pale. And, and, and it's going to reject a path of enlightenment which depends upon worshiping a foreign culture because romanticism rejects the notion of worshiping foreign cultures. So it's interesting that in Tudat B. Israel, of course, if Levinson is going to elevate Hebrew, he's got to attack Yiddish as the ultimate expression of exile. Right? It's a, he calls it a low and irredeemable language. It's basically, it's the mutt of the ling linguistic world. Right? It's made up of, of Middle German and pieces of Slavic, and there's you know, probably Romance languages thrown in there, and what have, of course, Hebrew. And, right? uh, so it's interesting that this notion of a pure language as a vehicle for true national will, that when people learn to speak their pure national language, they will speak to each other and they create a culture in that pure national language, that that will be the vehicle for articulating the national will. Remember, national government is the only legitimate government in this rising tide. And we said, how do you know who's the nation? Now you've got your first and really most central answer. The nation of the people who can speak to each other, who can create collectively, in the national language. You understand? I mean, it's actually, a, it's a beautiful notion which has a deep impact on Zionism. I'm sure many of us have experienced it. This idea of Hebrew in Hebrews, Hebrew for Hebrew's sake, or Ivrit for Ivrit, you know. But you should understand what the origins of that notion are, in Europe at least. Probably, if you're going to name one person more than any other, it's going to be Johann Gottfried von Herder, who, who um, as a thinker, and a, and a linguist, is perhaps the most important bridge between the German Enlightenment and the Romantic movement. 
and his passion for German culture knows no bounds, right? Herder publishes what he calls the treatise on the origin of language in 1772, and he establishes through it the foundations of what we today call comparative philology, right? That's the study of language in oral and written sources, right? And part and parcel of his whole linguistic perspective is the notion that a nation is defined by its language. If you want to understand Herder, and Herder plays a very important role, of course, in the development of German nationalism, which is a somewhat uncomfortable topic for most Jews. Uh, you want me to write Her Her Herder's name? Sure, I can do that. Um, although it's going to take me a second. One second. I get, that's, fair, that's a fair request. Um, Johann Gottfried von Herder. Um, oh, wait. So I'll you send that out. I just sent it to you accidentally privately. Um, the, so, so if you want to understand why, like, where's the danger here? What's the power? Right? I can just give you a quote from, um, from a, uh, a, a poem, actually, that Herder wrote, right? When he said that we called on his German people to reject the claims of French culture, language, and superiority. Remember, at this point, French culture is claiming to be the true international and supreme culture. He, he says, spew out the ugly slime of the Seine. Speak German, oh, you German. Right? We all know where that's going to go if you know a bit of European history. And so we should just be aware that the power of the argument that speaking a pure language and creating collectively within that pure language um, is, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's an energy which will be necessary for creating a Jewish body that will be able to liberate itself from exile. But notice that at its base is being welded this challenge of purity equals national will, and therefore impurity is downright betrayal, if not treason, right? How do you have a multicultural, multilinguistic national body? So uh, someone asked me, I made a sentence, national sentiment is gaining ground as a competitor to, I don't actually know what I said, <laughs> so I apologize, but I just wanted to register the fact that you asked. Um, okay, so where does this leave us? So when, when Isaac Barry Levinson writes to Dabi Israel and rejects Yiddish as this hopelessly corrupt vehicle and calls on and he actually even says it's the, it's the cause of the muddled thought and even the immoral behavior of the Jews. You know, um, he's building on Herder's foundation. Uh, now, Tudabi Israel was mildly popular amongst the Jews of the Pale. It wasn't a real competitor for, say, the great works of the Chassidut that were really the best sellers in the market. But where it really had its impact was in the eyes of the Russian government, believe it or not. Um, in 1823, Alexander I was Tsar. And his younger brother, Nicholas, became very interested in Tudabi Israel. Um, now, Alexander began his life as a friend of the Jews. There was, a, there was an early phase of um, lightning of the oppression that the Jews were experiencing, widening the boundaries of where they were allowed to settle. In fact, the first Jewish agricultural colonies in Russia were a result of his liberal policies. And it was a, a movement that actually would bear fruit ultimately in Zionism. The idea that Jews could own land and work it was a big innovation uh, for many of them. Um, but he allowed Jews to enter elementary and high schools. He opened up the universities more. Um, he, he recognized the importance of the coming wave of capitalism and tried to get the Jews to establish factories in the provinces where they were allowed to live. Um, he's quoted basically as saying, if through my efforts to improve their condition, I should succeed in bringing forth only one Mendelssohn from among the Russian Jews, I shall be abundantly rewarded. And again, this is that, as we spoke about this um, um, sort of absolutist, idealist stance that the Jews through enlightenment and emancipation will be made useful to the state and to human culture. Um, but in 18, 1818, a revolutionary conspiracy was, was uncovered. The, his own guards were trying to kill him, Alexander, and he lost his faith in liberalism along with all the events of uh, the fight with Napoleon, et cetera. Um, and he decided that actually the liberal approach to the Jewish problem was wrong. And he instead revoked their privileges. He added restrictions. 
and he, he handed over the job to his brother Nicholas, who discovered, partially through reading Tudab Yisrael, that the new solution to the Jewish question was Russification. You need to turn the Jews into Russians, right? And in fact, Nicholas helped fund the publication of Tudab Yisrael. And not only did he fund that, but when the Tsar Alexander dies, Nicholas becomes Tsar in 1825. Now, Isaac Levinson has the year of the emperor. And the emperor is very concerned with solving the Jewish problem. But he's also heavily under the influence of the rising nationalist thought because he's trying to create a, a Russian state out of a vast multi-ethnic empire. And frankly, the Jews are the largest minority population within his empire. And so they are a major problem. So he hands over, Nicholas, the czar, hands over the job to, to one of his ministers, Prince Levin, who, sub, who submits to Isaac Bear Levison 34 questions on Jewish religion and history. If you're familiar with Napoleon, it's very similar. It's like, listen, questions like, like uh, who was the author of the Talmud? When, where, and what language was it written? Have the Jews other books of authority? I mean, it's everything you ever want to know about the Jews, but couldn't be bothered to ask. So now he wants to know. Um, and the result was an unbelievably brutal process of Russification. Someone mentioned in the chat here earlier the idea of the Cantonists, something that many Jews are familiar as, a, as an episode um, in Jewish history. In 1827, the Tsar declared military service to be compulsory for all Jews in Russia. And not only was it compulsory, the age of the draft was, was at, at 12 years old, and the period of conscription was for 25 years. The goal being to basically take Jews as young as they possibly could away from their homes and turn them into Russian. And the Cantonist units that they established, which is where the word comes from, were originally barracks that had been established for the children of Russian soldiers, but they now filled them with Jewish child soldiers who were condemned to 25 years. And at 18, they would then get drafted into the regular army to serve that full obligation. Um, this was what they called a keystone in, in the project for correcting the Jews of Russia, right? He was going to Russify them. Um, as an evil twist, by the way, they made the Jewish authorities of every community responsible for supplying the quota of Cantonists, which led to a whole ugly phenomenon of rich people paying others to go or for people being snatched, children being snatched off the street by what are called hoppers, right? And, and, and essentially selling them to the Russians. If you want to understand the cultural basis, the cultural basis, mind you, I'm not talking about the political present day, but the historical cultural basis for the Haredi world's opposition to military service, you need to understand the, the sort of scar that the Cantonist movement left in the religious consciousness of the Jewish people. It wasn't a quick phase of history. Not a quick phase of history. Um, so, but for our purposes, it's, it's, it, it is a passing comment. Um, and even in the midst of this, in the 1830s, Levinson was asked by the Tsar's government to now make broad recommendations on how to reform Jewish life. In the end, he publishes Beit Yehuda. It's a full plan for Jewish reformation, um, education. He wants rabbinical seminaries along the lines of the German institutions that were incorporating both religious and secular learning. He wanted to open elementary Jewish schools throughout the pale, agriculture, industry, all the, all the elements of the Enlightenment. Now, he, he tried to fight for the elements of sort of Jewish particularism to be preserved within it, but um, he really was swimming against the stream of the power of the Tsar. However, I would say that when Levinson dies in 1860, the Russian Haskalah is now actually a movement instead of his personal dream. And the path of Russification, of integration into Russian society, of assimilation, essentially, is, is open. So now we have laid the groundwork for understanding Pinsker and the, the shift that he represents. Questions or comments before I take the last 25 minutes and, and, uh, and really sort of put the cap on it with Pinsker. I'm looking in the chats here too. Um, Hi. Yes. I think 
Um, okay. Your comment about the Haredi opposition to the draft, the Israeli yeah. draft, is that something that they have ex expressed that they view um, their sons and... Um, oh, it's, I mean, it's explicit. If you're taken to the army, you're going to come out fry. And not only are you going to come out fry, but that's the goal of taking the army. And then sadly, by the way, it's not completely uh, based in fantasy. If you look at the history of the way in which the secular institutions of state have related to the religious world. But I don't want to go too far into that. You and I, can, I'm happy to speak about that sometime, if okay. you like. Thank Questions you. sort of on our immediate, our immediate narrative that will help clarify for people or are, are all going to move forward? Okay. You guys will write them in if things come up. Um, okay, so. I tell you this. What's that, Saul? No, sir. No, no, it's all right. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, so the, we have to remember the Jewish problem. Just to review very quickly, when, when we were people in our land during the time of the Romans, we were the indigestible element of empire, right? Meaning we fought one, two, three Roman wars while the rest of the Mediterranean had been beaten into submission with what they call the Pax Roman. As soon as the Romans managed to solve that as a political problem, because they uprooted us from our land, along comes Christianity, chops the Ro Roman Empire, and even though we no longer pose a political problem, because we don't have a physical basis for our land, we become a religious problem. We go from being the indigestible element of empire to the obstinate refuser of Christian salvation. And that defines the role that we play in many ways in the Middle Ages. Well, Christianity is no longer the organizing principle, at least explicitly so, of European culture that we're engaged with. What's the organizing principle? Enlightenment and modernity. Within enlightenment and modernity, what, what we're after now is homogenization. Either the cosmopolitan version of homogenization, we saw last week, where everybody's part of the community, but you got to give up that Jewish particular thing, or the, the nationalist notion of homogenization, which is a purity of language, of history within a defined territory. Well, the Jews speak a different language and we have a different history, right? And so therefore assimilation seems to be the solution, but what we're going to see is it simply doesn't work. The Jew, if we were the obstinate, sorry, if we were the indigestible element of empire to the Romans, and the obstinate refusers of salvation to the Christians will be the alien other of modern society. The Jew just doesn't go away. You can't erase the Jew, right? Which will give rise, if you're familiar, to racial anti-Semitism, which we're not really going to touch now. But I want you to know that as a context. Remember, I did quote to you, by the way, Hess's, Moshe Hess's realization that what the Germans hate is not so much Jewish religion or Jewish names as Jewish noses, right? That, that there's some rising sense of an intrinsic, indelible, you can't convert, you can't assimilate, you, 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 you know, there's nothing to be done, they just have to be eliminated. Right? Um, so that is a very important part of the context for the rise of Leon Pinsker. So Pinsker is actually born Yehuda Leib Pinsker in the Pale of Settlement in 1821. And he is a successful product of Isaac Bear Levinson's vision for reform. That's why I spent all the time there. What do I mean? His father, Simcha Pinsker, was a rabbi and a mosque at the same time, rabbi and an, an enlightened Jew. He was a linguist. He was a scholar of, of Karite literature, right? And he was a key representative of this Chochmat Yisrael, this sort of local version of the science of Judaism. Right before, excuse me, right before a young Leon or Yehuda Leib is born, the family moves to Odessa, and his father begins to teach Hebrew, of course, at a reformed Jewish primary school, which itself was a product of Levinson's sort of vision, because uh, their religious study was combined with Hebrew grammar, secular studies, Russian, and even German. Now, now, little Yudel Leib does get a strong Jewish identity in his home, but he also imbibes a deep commitment to Mother Russia, right? And, and, and this is one of the things that we have to understand about a lot of the sort of proto-Zionists of his generation, is that he was a Jew, and this, this, this sort of facile dichotomy that a lot of historians like to put out, it's mostly said about Herzl. Like, Herzl was completely detached from his Judaism until he went to the Dreyfus trial and oh my gosh, he realized he's a Jew. Life doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't, right? Also Pinsker, you will hear very often because Pinsker is seen as a direct precursor to Herzl. He was completely, he was a militant assimilationist. And then we'll talk about what the end then was in a moment. He became a nationalist. 
it's not so simple. In the same way that Moshe has never gave up on his belief in utopian socialism, people like Pinsker never really gave up on their desire to participate in the larger society in which they found themselves. For him, it was Russia. But, but, and so we're going to see that, that that desire to be accepted amongst the nations is also going to be baked in at the base of the Zionist project. So, okay. So, so Yudalev is one of the first Jews to actually attend Odessa University, where he studies law as a good Jew. But the problem is, is that it's not that liberal in Russia yet. So when he graduates with a law degree, there are strict quotas on Jewish lawyers. They figured that one out quickly, right? Um, and so he saw no real chance at a career. And instead, um, he, a few years later, he's accepted to study medicine at Moscow University. He actually becomes one of the first Jewish medical students in Tsarist Russia, right? He, he, um, he receives advanced training in Germany and Austria. He comes back to Odessa, hometown hero. He's actually one of the city's most respected people. He's a successful private physician. He serves as director of the psychiatric department of the municipal hospital. He fights in the Crimean War and gets a commendation for bravery. Notice, he is a lover of Mother Russia, but he's also identifies as a Jew. Now, the, the larger context is that he, of course, is not alone. Since the death of Isaac Baer back in 1860, the program for Russification of the Jews has proceeded quite admirably, right? Russian education, meaning in the language, has spread amongst a significant proportion of the population of the pale. There are a number of Russian language periodicals which are launched by Jews. And Pinsker is actually the beginning or part of the beginnings of that effort. He's a founder of a weekly paper in Russian known as Razviet. And the purpose of the paper is broadcasting the message that the future of Russian Jews lays in integration within Russian society at large. Now notice, integration is not quite the same as assimilation, but in the end of the day, it becomes a facile distinction. You understand what I mean? We live in a multicultural society where today, nominally at least, one hopes that you don't have to give up on your particular culture to be a full participant within society. That was not so in his day. And so, so the attempt to dance at two weddings of being a Jew and a loyal Russian is, is not going to end so well. So, okay. Um, but the, the, way, the way he phrases it in an article he writes in the 1860s is that, that enlightened Russian Jews must aspire to the twin goals that history has placed before them. To become the sons of their time and the sons of their immediate homeland without ceasing to be true Jews. Sons of their time, that's the Haskalah, enlightenment. Sons of their immediate homeland, Mama Russia, and true Jews. Now, what a true Jew is to Pinsker is, is hard to say, but it's certainly someone who speaks the Hebrew language, who has a grasp of the culture, who has a loyalty to its cultural institutions. Um, now, 1861 begins a process of liberalization, a new wave of liberalization in Russia, right? Tsar Alexander II, if you want to know which one it is, he's the one who frees the serfs. He's known as the liberator of Russia. He takes Russia finally out of the last institutional element of the feudal era, so I guess better late than never, right? Um, but 10 years later, the, um, the sort of liberal atmosphere begins to break down. The, and it happens in the city of Odessa, which is one of the more multicultural cities in the Russian empire at this point, right? Christian Holy Week historically has always been a time of conflict between Jews and, and Christians. Um, and in particular in Odessa, it was a time of regular riots between Jews and the Greek Orthodox who make up a very large portion of the population of Odessa. And in 1871, a rumor circulates that some Jews had vandalized a Greek church. And once again, this intercommunal violence breaks out. Now, like I said, this is an annual event, but this time, many non-Greek Russians joined into the riot, which meant that the police couldn't really so easily intervene. Um, and it, soon the situation develops into a full-scale pogrom. And, and Pinsker witnesses the depth of anti-Semitism, of Jew hatred, which is being expressed, it shocks not only him, but all the Jews of Russia, right? This, again, is the classic, you know, classic Christian anti-Semitism. They kill our God, and the, I have a quote here, the Jews offended our Christ, they grow rich and suck our blood. Now, the, many historians see 1871 as a sort of a wake-up call that caused people like Pinsker to be into question whether it was really feasible at this stage to integrate into Russian Christian society. 
um, and therefore a, a turn toward a, a sort of uh, more of a Jewish, we call it national consciousness. Again, similar to Hess. It's like I haven't given up on the ideal of emancipation, but practically speaking, it doesn't look like it's working. And so therefore, what you end up going toward is like, well, we got to get out of here. <laughs> like, you know, listen, and if Ashavo and Mashiach Tikkena will all be one happy planet. Until then, I think I'd like to go home, please. And, but really the worst comes in 1881. 1881, Alexander II, sorry, Alexander II, is assassinated by a member of what's called the People's Will Movement in Petersburg, and the results are devastating. Right? There's a reactionary political wave that sweeps Russia. All the reforms that the Tsar had gone had basically were all but forgotten. His son, Alexander III, who actually witnessed the death assassination of his father, he passes what are known as the May Laws, which begin limiting Jews in residence once again back to the pale and taking away the civil rights that they gained. And finally, a wave of pogroms begins to sweep Russia between 1881 and 1884. It's known as the Storm in the South. And there's a lot of historical debate around it, but at least it was perceived by the Jews of the time that um, the perceived the Jews of the time to be state sponsored, and it was all part of what appeared to be a new solution to the Jewish problem, which was being proposed by who Constantine. I, I'm not even going to bother to try to pronounce his name. What I'll do is I will write it to you all so that you can mangle it in your own pronunciation. One second. Right, Const Constantine, I can say. Constan, sorry, team. Here's the problem. Anybody who can say this will get a shiny silver penny from me later. Of course, a shiny silver penny is actually probably worth a lot of money today. Pub, I already spelled it wrong. Pub, no, no. There you go. Good luck. Um, the, the, he is, um, he, was, he had been a um, supporter of liberal reform under Tsar Alexander II. He is the supervisor of the Russian Orthodox Church. He becomes the chief advisor to the young Tsar Alexander III. And when he sees what he calls the fabric of traditional Russian society eroding and in the face of these reforms, he, he becomes a reactionary after the assassination of Alexander II and decides that only the deeper spiritual unity of the Russian people, and in particular the unity with the Tsar, was going to preserve Russia. And the Jews were, in his eyes, the chief obstacle to that goal. His solution was quite simple and quite brutal. As he's quoted by saying, one third will die, one third will leave the country, and the last third will be completely assimilated within the Russian people. You may have heard this quote before, and this is why I saw somebody put there in the notes, so Avram put it, that, that, um, that from 1880 to 1920, more than 2 million Jews will flee Russia, mostly to the United States, and then a, a few of them will be involved in the early phases of um, Zionist Aliyah to what is at the time Ottoman Palestine. Um, and this was the environment in which Leon Pinsker was forced, along with many other advocates of Russification, to seek a new solution to the Jewish problem. And uh, I would say that the, the solution was, was quite dramatic. Right? He, in 1882, on January 1st, Pinsker publishes a German language pamphlet uh, in which he claims that assimilation is an impossible dream, and he urges the Jewish people to strive for independence and national consciousness. That pamphlet, of course, is known as auto-emancipation. Right? Now, in many ways, the, the title says it all, auto-emancipation. We're done waiting. I've got a great quote here, right? Um, the, the uh, where is it? Come on now. Um, he says, for almost 2,000 years, we've been patient. And if we'd taken agency in our redemption, it's been almost exclusively through adherence to the Torah. Remember, Oh, sorry. Uh, that's, no, sorry. That's my quote, not him. <laughs> that sounded good, though, didn't it? This is the lack of national self-respect and self-confidence of political initiative and of unity are the enemies of our national renaissance. Help yourselves and God will help you. Right? This not only is a, is a consistent call. Remember, the religious heralds of Zionism, we were also encountering this idea of being partners in redemption. 
But what Pinsker is, is actually placing at the base of what will become the Zionist endeavor is this idea that you've got to leave God behind if you're going to help yourself. And that together with this desire, if not to assimilate, then at least to be accepted by the non-Jewish world has a deep impact on what becomes known as political Zionism, right? In fact, in many ways, those are the cultural characteristics of political Zionism, which desires to create a nation like any other. Now, Pinsker was a doctor, as we said, um, and he actually diagnoses the disease of the Jewish people in exile as, he doesn't call it anti-Semitism, although the word is coined more or less around this time in the German language, right? Um, he calls it Judeophobia, and he says it will remain an incurable disease so long as the Jew is a disembodied ghost amongst the nation, he says, right? And he says the Jews are a distinctive element, right? And as such can neither assimilate nor be readily digested by any nation. And the only solution is by readjusting this exclusive element to the family of nations that the basis of the Jewish question will be permanently removed. Meaning you, we must get out from our dispersed state because our dispersed state is the cause of the hatred. He says, to the living, the Jew is a corpse. To the native, he's a foreigner. To the homesteader, he's a vagrant. To the, pro the, to the, pro oh, to the proprietary, a beggar. To the poor, an exploiter and a millionaire. To the patriot, a man without a country. For all, the Jew is a hated rival, right? Um, yes, the word antisemitism was coined in 1879, but, but it's important because this is another piece that Pinsker hardwires, as it were, into political Zionism. That the problem of the Jews, the Jewish problem is anti-Semitism. And that the solution is nationalism. That if we could just get back to our land, we could be a people like any other. If you question Barbara, please just write it in the chat. Um, the, the, um, okay, then I'll try to get to you right at the end, but I, I just wanna, wanna make this point. I did see, thank you. Um, the, the problem, as opposed to the problem just being exile, or as opposed to the problem of the Jew finding his right place within society, which was originally what Pinsker thought, right? Russification wasn't pure assimilation, it was finding a right place. Now, having seen in the midst of this, after this wave of enlightenment and liberalism, et cetera, this almost medieval sort of wave of reaction, he says, no, anti-Semitism is an intrinsic response to the state of the Jews in dispersion, the only solution is a reconstitution as a people within its land, right? And in, in doing this, again, I wanna emphasize, what has he done? He's placed the aspiration to be a people like any other at the base of political Zionism. He's, he's made assimilation, or at least this sort of acculturation element, a legitimate tactic, which now is going to take place on a national scale, will be a nation like any other, instead of Russians like any other. And he's identified squarely anti-Semitism as the problem and, na and national reconstitution as the solution. So Pinsker, by the way, wasn't all words. He, um, you know, he already even in 1878, before he published the pamphlet, was the first sort of famous founding of what's known as Petach Tikva by a group of religious Jews, right? It's the mother of all agricultural settlements in Israel. But it was part of a, a larger movement, which is a very loose coalition called the Kova Beit Zion, the Lovers of Zion. It's at this point in the, the late 1870s, early 1880s, that small groups of Jews become, begin to return to the land and try to establish agricultural villages, or even what we might call colonies. They're being backed by people like, like Baron Rothschild, who has lots of money and is investing in a, a growing wine industry there. And in 1884, Pinsker gathers together 34 de delegates in, in Katowice in Germany um, and creates a true organization called the Lovers of Zion. You should understand that's 1884, that's 12 years before, sorry, 13 years before the first Zionist Congress, no, 1896. It's 12 years, um, 1897, yeah, 1897, 13 years before the, uh, the first Zionist Congress. That means that when the first Zionist Congress happens, there are 4,000 members of Chovetzion. It's important to know that because oftentimes Hit, uh, Hitler, whoops, Herzl is, is painted as the sort of originator of Zionism, but, but you're seeing a tremendous momentum here. And in many ways, I mean, I'll just read to you in Herzl's own words, and then I'll get your question, Barbara. Um, in Herzl's own words that he says in his, in his diary, 
from February 10th, 1896. Just as Herzl's book, The Jewish State, is being published, he writes in his diary, read today Pinsker's pamphlet, Auto Emancipation. Dumbfounding agreement on the critical side, great similarity in the constructive. A pity I had not read it before my own pamphlet was printed. Still, it's a good thing I knew nothing of it, or perhaps I might have abandoned my own undertaking. That, in, it, that it is a justified link, which is made between Pinsker and Herzl, but um, in many ways, you know, it, it, it takes a certain type of personality to take an idea and make it into a movement. And that will really wait till Herzl. Okay, I'm done with that. Barbara, you've been very patient. You got a question there. Okay, Mike, can you yeah. hear me? I hear you great. All right. I'm sorry, I just feel like the last five minutes you went really quickly uh -huh. and lost. Okay, so let me tell you where I'm okay. Well, would it be helpful for you if I reviewed all the elements yeah. of Pinsker's? No? no? Okay. Yeah, no. So when you said he wrote the Auto Emancipation, Yes. First you said that he said, help yourselves and God will help you. Right. But then he said something about he didn't believe in God. So I didn't understand what you meant by that. Well, I mean, help yourselves and God will help you sounds nice as a slogan. But, but the way it's eventually translated practically. So you said he was anti-religious? But you said until now no, he he's was, been. He, he wasn't anti-religious, but he represents this growing sense amongst sort of um, emancipated Jews, that religion is, a, um, is a, a breaking force. It's holding back our practical efforts. And that will become pronounced when indeed, af after the first Zionist Congress and, and the birth of a political movement, almost universally the religious world will stand in opposition. And that's when this sort of help yourselves and God will help you will become, well, I don't need God, I'm gonna help myself. <laughs> You know, so Pinsker okay. is again, he's, he's dancing at two weddings in many cases. Good. Yeah, what else? So, but, I mean, this is a huge, what else influenced him? Be, do you understand? So the pogroms that happened, all of a sudden he had this huge, do you understand no, what I'm it, saying? It's yeah, like, I understand what you're saying. And maybe I'll end with this because I got a few minutes. Is that, that that's why I said you want to be wary of, of what I call facile historiography. There's a temptation to say, he was an assimilationist, and then he had this pogrom experience. He said, assimilation doesn't work, and we need to become nationalists. Just like people like to say about Herzl, that he was assimilated, <laughs> and then he, the Dreyfus trial. And it, it's, it's not true. It's not the way people work. It's not the way history works. What he was, as I tried to build the picture, is he was a person who was trying to hold two sides right. of the Jewish story. The answer to it. He, the particularist element of a Jewish pride and culture and the desire to be an emancipated, enlightened member of a new Russian society. Right. When he saw through the pogroms that yeah. that dream may be very far off and yeah. that the very existential threat of anti-Semitism could snuff the Jews out before it was ever realized, right. that's when his, 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 I would call his visionary enlightenment element took a back seat to the okay. sort of practical nationalist element. And this is the key I want you to understand is that at this point, and maybe if you could just mute because I want to finish off in the last two words, and I'm happy to stick around for a minute or two okay. at, at the end if you want to ask a couple more questions. I appreciate your patience. Um, at this point, I want you to understand is that, is that we have not yet seen idealistic nationalism, right? At this point, nationalism has, has only really served as a pragmatic vehicle or, or perhaps an interim stage, like for Hess in the realization of this socialist utopia, or for, like for, for Pinsker, it's a solution to the problem of anti-Semitism. It will wait until people like Max Nordau and, uh, and uh, Zev Jabotinsky to, to, the, to the point where enough of the idealistic side of European national, although in all fairness, we did see a little bit with the linguistic purity and the emphasis on Hebrew, but that was an emphasis which joined together with the more sort of emancipation assimilationist stance. I mean, Isaac Thayer Levinson wasn't, he wasn't a nationalist, though he believed in, in the importance of a pure Hebrew language. So at this point, just to the, give the, the, the dots, right, we, we saw the sort of religious messianic element and the awakening of a, a pragmatic recognition that we need to be partners in redemption. The, the, um, we saw in Hess, this tension between the sort of universalist cosmopolitan utopian socialist vision 
And again, the collapse back to a pragmatic sense that actually perhaps the world works better when it's broken into nations than in a cosmopolitan unity. And now we have Pinsker, who the two sides of the Russian enlightenment, Vaskala, which were embodied with him, the sense of a deep loyalty to place and a valuing of the enlightenment and emancipation sort of the culture, together with a real pride and an organic expression of Judaism. It's not just an intellectual construct, it's an organic expression, it's how he was raised, it's who he is, and an attempt to try to reconcile those through an acceptance within Russian society, which collapses between 1871 and 1881, and never causes him to abandon the belief in emancipation, just causes him to shift tactics toward a national solution to the problem of anti-Semitism. And then we now have uh, three of the Heralds of Zionism, and I think it's laid a good groundwork for us. I appreciate everybody's uh, patience and participation, and uh, I'm going to stop there. But I'm good to my promise. Robert, if you want to hang around for, for a couple of minutes and, and ask some more questions, I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Mike. You're sure. Thank you very You're welcome, much, guys. Mike. We're looking to you. Thank Thanks, you, Mike. Mike. Thanks to everybody. Uh, just a reminder that tomorrow uh, classes begin at 9 a.m. with uh, Rav Ot, followed at 10.30, um, Alex Israel, and 12 o'clock, Michal Kahane with uh, our, our roundup of Daf Yomi. Thanks again, Mike. You're welcome. Please leave the meeting open. Yeah, Barbara, I'll, I'll close it. That, no problem. No problem. Um, okay, Bob, are you with me? Yeah, okay, so at the end, it just got a little, you said in the 1880s, small groups started to move to Israel, and then you- Yeah. The first, what the first, was called the So the first new agricultural settlement in Israel is Petach, was Petach Tikva, which okay. is a biblical quote. It means, it literally means the opening of hope. Um, and it was a group of religious Jews who in many ways were inspired by the sort of vision of Rav Alkali and Rav Kalisher that we spoke about, that, that an actual engagement with the land was a key trigger for redemption. But they also had that element of, we got to get out of Dodge. Like your life in Europe is going downhill. Um, okay. and, and there was even an element of um, the, uh, hang on one second, I'll tell you, um, one second. There was, there was even an element of, uh, of, of wanting to sort of re-engage the land. The, um, you know, so that was 1878. They weren't really part of any movement. There, is, was, there was something called Beit Yaakov, the Juvenelcha, was called Bilir. Right, right. I had heard all of these right, from before, right. so, but they, they were disparate? To call it, no, well, to call, that a, to call it a movement is a little bit of an, a, a post facto looking back. They right. were people who were inspired and who managed to convince wealthy men like Rothschild to give them right. the money. But what happened is, is that those little bits and pieces between 1878 and Pinskiller's publication of Auto-Emancipation in 1882, which right. we didn't, I didn't get into it, and well, maybe I'll touch on it as a part of my review when I pick up next week. He actually proposes a practical, like joint stock venture solution. And, and, and in fact, right. I need to, he, he, it's not just an inspirational pamphlet. He, like Herzl, if you've read The Jewish State, right? Um, he actually proposes what is perhaps not the most financially sound approach, but it is a pragmatic approach. He even says, if it's not gonna be in, 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 uh, you know, in Ottoman Palestine, we could do it on the banks of Mississippi, right? He wasn't necessarily a oh, Zionist nice. in that sense. Okay. And I like to imagine what it'd be like if we all lived in Missouri right now. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, all right, the, the Chova Vatium. And so what happened is then, 34 delegates in 1884, okay. Pinsker convenes representatives of all these little groups that had begun to call themselves the lovers of Zion, which is what Chovei Zion. He convenes them in Katowice in Germany in 1884, and they, they create an official institution. If you're familiar with Rav Mahalover, who becomes a very important um, mm -hmm. personality in early religious Zionism, he's elected president. Um, and, and they essentially, it gives them a voice to go to men like Rothschild and other wealthy Jews and try to... Um, and try to get their, their backing. It's much easier if you can show we just had a conference and the 34 delegates and here's our president, a respected rabbi, et cetera, give us money for this plan. It's much easier to sell, right? Than this mm -hmm. group and that group. And that's- There was no internet. How did he, these 34 delegates, I mean, how did he even know they existed? How did he- uh, I mean, how did communication happen before the internet? Letters, uh, word of mouth, you know, and the, Jew, the Jews are highly interconnected. 
Were they just from Russia or were they from Newspapers. No, no, they were all over. They were primarily Eastern European. I don't mm-hmm. actually, actually don't know the spread, but they weren't exclusively from Russia. But that's pretty amazing that he wasn't the only one, that there were other people and, and, at this and, point. And this is part of the question, which I appreciate you bringing up now, because I'll, I'll try to bring it out a little bit more in, in the introduction to class next week, which is, this just a question, like, how come this all started to, like, bubble yeah. up in the, yeah. from the mid-19th 18, mid 18th century onwards? Everybody has their post-facto explanation. Well, that's true. Oh, it was because of this, but, it was because of that. But, like, if you kind of just stand back and look at it, you say, like, something going on here. <laughs> like, something, something going, okay. It's coming from all these different directions, which is why I like this type of approach, is the heralds of Zionism. I can see where it came from the religious. I can see where it came from the sort of utopian socialists. I can see where it came from from the nationalists. So that was my other but... question. These 34 delegates, what was their, what were they composed of? What type of people? They were composed were of people who loved Zion. And yeah. by the way, most of them were religious. Interesting. Okay, Mostly wow. Petach, both Petach Tikva and Rishon Litzion, which are, in, are the two earliest settlements. Um, in fact, the, the Chobave movement was by and large religious Jews who came back to build um, agricultural settlements in, in Israel. Okay. Well, thanks guys for, for the, the hard work and I will see you all next week.